Thank you for joining us this afternoon as the IAFC leadership prepares to discuss the coronavirus in the United States and ways that the Fire and Emergency Service can prepare to respond to this illness as it spreads in the United States. The audio during this webinar is being broadcast using voice over IP technology and is coming through your computer speakers or headset. Please ensure your speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is turned up. If during the course of this webinar you experience any technical difficulties, please contact WebEx support at either the phone number or the URL indicated below. At this point, I would like to hand the presentation over to IAFC President Chief Gary Ludwig, who will provide an overview of today's speakers, as well as discuss the current status of coronavirus in the United States. Chief Ludwig. Thank you, Evan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar. We had over 2,200 people register for this webinar on the coronavirus. Unfortunately, some of you were not able to get on and are listening to a recording. The demand was too great for the bandwidth. However, we are providing this webinar and more webinars in the following weeks to keep our members and the fire service informed and up to date on this very fluid and moving situation. The IFC represents the leadership of over 1.2 million firefighters. We are in uncharted waters after President Trump made a declaration of a national emergency last week. Anticipating this issue becoming more fluid and more demanding, but not to this magnitude, on February the 1st, the IFC put up a webpage with a live ESRI map showing up to minute cases of coronavirus around the United States and the rest of the world. We also provided links to the CDC and the WHO websites for best practices. Seeing that the issue was escalating, I activated a Corona Task Force on February the 29th, chaired by past IFC President Chief John Sinclair. John has been involved in past task forces dealing with emerging diseases and was the right person for the job. John graciously accepted the challenge. John has put together this task force, task force with a wide range of talent. Members include chiefs with knowledge of emerging diseases, uh, the IFF, I, I talked to Pat Morrison. I asked him to be a member of this task force. Pat is over safety, safety and health with the IFF, and he graciously agreed. In the past, we've had some issues with the ISC and the IFF with some mixed messaging. This time, we will be consistent with our messaging. Other members of the task force include AMR, which has 38,000 employees. The United States Fire Administration has representatives on the task force the private sector, and also members of the IFC staff. Some of those you will hear from today. We take the safety and health of our firefighters very seriously. We are also aware of the challenges of our, to our members who must provide essential services to their communities during these difficult times. Lastly, I would ask that we not panic like some on the outside of our profession are doing. We need to be the voice of calmness and civility in our communities. I hope you enjoy the webinar and get much useful information. Now, I would like to turn it over to my good friend, Dr. Jim Augustine. Interacting with patients is six feet away. Person to person is the likely way that this is spread. This is not an aerosol. An aerosol, think anthrax spores that are suspended in the air uh, and are capable of taking for prolonged periods of time. The symptoms um, typical to the COVID virus uh, are upper respiratory symptoms, and the typical time of onset five days after exposure. Please go ahead. Our plan for approach to the, the virus includes the P's, the personnel, the places, the processes, and uh, importantly, uh, remembering and are planning for this fire chiefs uh, that this will eventually end uh, and that we'll need to develop better processes as a result of it. Our personnel uh, want to know that they can go home safely uh, at the end of their shift. They will keep their families safe. They'll keep their communities safe. Using and protecting our places means both our fire stations and uh, places where we house our personnel, uh, as well as hospitals and other sites where we have to take the patients for care. We have mutual responsibilities to protect our fire stations and places where we're housed. 
uh, and over the coming weeks, uh, all of us may need to kind of lock down our facilities to make sure that they stay safe and in some ways reduce our interactions with the public, which none of us really like. Our places uh, for the patient uh, include new testing sites uh, where they can get out of hospital testing done. Number two, low acuity patient care sites uh, that don't require the use of hospital resources, uh, and then hospitals for acutely ill individuals. The processes are what we will cover through the through the next hour here, uh, and very important again that we protect both the communities and the people uh, that are doing battle. A very important thing for us to remember is what we can't do during the battle is lose our forces. Next slide. An important start to this is uh, what comes across in the 911 centers and their scripts are changing. Uh, at first, travel was an important element of where we could highlight at-risk patients. Uh, since we now have community spread in too many communities to ask about individually, uh, and we really don't know where the next cases are coming from, travel has become a less important way of evaluating a patient's risk. We would love it if each disease would come with a unique symptom that we could highlight in our interview of a patient, both over the phone or in person, uh, that, would, that would really uh, be able to identify for us the patients that are at risk. Unfortunately, COVID illness has no unique symptoms, particularly at its onset. The typical presentation of this in the community is runny nose, dry cough, and a sore throat. As essentially all of our country moves into allergy season, this will be very hard to distinguish uh, from a presentation of an allergy patient. Later in the disease, um, we get the more difficult symptoms uh, and ones that indicate higher acuity. That is fever, difficulty breathing, and some form of cardiovascular collapse. Uh, at that point, we have to take the highest forms of protection in dealing with patients, and at that time, it may be more obvious. What we will be doing now is evolving our 911 dispatch protocols to ask callers if they have known disease or a known exposure. And with that information being given to the crews, they may be able to upgrade their personal protective equipment use before they arrive at the scene. Next slide. The immediate need is to get a mask on the patient because the single most effective way to reduce the spread of virus particles from an affected individual uh, is to put a mask on the patient. That mask should cover the nose and the mouth and the lower part of the face. We, if we also use an open ear approach to the patient, either asking them early on in the interaction to step outside or even in some cases, if the dispatchers uh, and 911 call takers would ask the patient to move outside and greet our crews there, uh, we further minimize exposure and minimize the use of our proper personal protective equipment. What is important to know is when we move into higher risk patient encounters, particularly those that involve us using aerosol generating procedures, uh, which I'll outline in a second here, we have to move towards higher level protection. So beyond our typical approach, proper PPE is a mask on our face, goggles or a face shield covering our eyes, and gloves. If we're moving towards an interaction which may include the patient expelling uh, more material, uh, we need to add a gown or coveralls uh, and move up at least to an N95 mask. We also assist our crews if we are doing high ventilation in patient compartments um, and allow, again, fresh air to dilute any quantities of particles that are coming out of a patient. Aerosol generating procedures is uh, kind of a new term, and that means anything we do that makes the patient spew virus, either from their nose or their mouth, which are the two highest sites of concentration of the virus. If you spray something in their nose or insert material into their mouth, including one of our tubes or a nebulizer treatment, uh, those are asking the patient to cough or sneeze. And in those cases, again, droplets are gonna come out at a high speed and at a high rate. Therefore, anything that generates aerosols from 
intranasal approaches to medicines, uh, putting a swab in their nose to do a swab test, uh, giving a nebulizer treatment, introducing non-invasive positive pressure ventilation like CPAP or intubating patients are all very high-risk procedures. During SARS, these were a way to dramatically increase the risk of infection in the healthcare provider. Uh, therefore, moving into any of those aerosol generating procedures requires us to move up in our use of PPE. We eventually get the patient into our ambulance and in the patient compartment, uh, high, high levels of ventilation should be used whenever possible. The driver should be protected from the patient in the back and have the opportunity uh, to move down to uh, just a mask uh, for protection in the driver's compartment. We have also upgraded many of our responses to have only one provider who's within a six foot radius at any time of the patient to minimize the number of people that may be exposed with any individual patient encounter. Next slide. I will finish by saying our interactions are changing at the hospital. Uh, the hospitals are, are having to upgrade to protect their staff and their facility. Many you will see now implementing this week universal respiratory precautions for all patient encounters in the emergency department. Uh, therefore, you may be encountering people who receive a, a turnover of care outside the emergency department, and they will be fully dressed uh, in protective wear appropriate to the hospital. They may also be utilizing outdoor tents and other ways of, again, taking advantage of fresh air uh, to dilute the exposure of the staff uh, from the from the uh, patients. Hospitals are also limiting admission to the sickest of patients, making an attempt to send those with mild illness home and have them do home monitoring. It should be known by all of us that <clears throat> those patients will fail home monitoring, they will get into trouble, they will call 911, and it's those patients which we have to do an extra good job of, of getting information ahead of time with this being a known COVID patient who we are going to see because they've had increasing symptoms. Uh, therefore, that's our high risk patient encounter and our crew should be prepared for that. Finally, testing uh, for COVID is moving offsite and all of you may be involved in tents and other uh, types of temporary facilities being put outside and in large big box parking lots uh, where the testing for this disease is moving away from hospital facilities uh, and, as in the rest of the world, uh, moving to facilities that can be driven through very easily and where traffic patterns can be set up to accommodate the volume. All of this moves us uh, to a new day in our utilization of both our PPE and in moving to protection of our personnel. Uh, I'd like to introduce John Sinclair, who's done an outstanding job of pulling this task force together, moving us in the right direction, and he has some late-breaking news on use of PPE. John. Thank you very much, Dr. Augustine. Um, so, Evan, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, right here. So, before I get to the PPE issue, let's talk about decontamination. Uh, the one thing that we're encouraging everybody to do is to take a look at the difference between station cleaning, um, apparatus cleaning, and actually decontamination. Um, it is very important that um, we get as much airflow in and out of those um, patient compartments while transferring patients and completing um, any reports that they may have. You may want to take a look at, are they going to write the report in the back of the unit, or are they going to do that away, away from the patient? Um, you're going to want to take a look at your cleaning schedule of your stations um, and make sure that you're disinfecting all of your surfaces, all the handles, everything where somebody is touching frequently, and, and I realize that you've heard this ad nauseum, but frequent hand washing and making sure that you don't touch your face is one of the ways that we're going to break the chain on this. So um, increasing not just your cleaning, but your disinfecting frequency of the fire stations 
And any time that the rig goes out on a call, that's your engines, that's your medic units, when they come back, uh, making sure that you're disinfecting. Um, if you have a patient that presents at the fire station, uh, if it's possible for you to keep them outside um, and call in the still alarm, if you can put them in the vestibule so that you're not getting them coughing and hacking um, in the station itself. There are, uh, so just today in the state of Washington, um, the governor decided to extend uh, social distancing policies where he's closed down uh, gyms, barbershops, beauty salons, nail salons, uh, places where people gather yesterday. They closed all restaurants, bars. Uh, previous to that, they had closed all schools. So as, as you look at this, and, and chiefs from other states, take a look at what Washington is doing, because at this point, we have one of the highest fatality rates, and our, uh, our governor is ramping up uh, things, and it is likely that your governors and uh, your uh, elected leaders will be following some of the things that we're doing here in Washington State. So we can go to the next slide. Um, one of the things that we have worked on that we are recommending that the chiefs uh, get with their uh, labor force, whether that's your volunteers, whether or not that you have a, a, an IFF local or some other union related activities. Um, and you're going to need to get with the public health, health officer, uh, competent legal counsel, your attorney, to talk about what does quarantine versus isolation look like. If you have to um, isolate crews, if you have to quarantine crews, what does that look like? Is that going to be on, um, is that going to be on admin leave? Is it going to be on sick leave? All of those things are very important to work out before you have to do this for the first time. And it is very important that you have those discussions with your elected so that you're setting the tone with this. Make sure that you're having the conversation with your labor force, no matter who it is, whether it's volunteer or you've got career people. And then what sort of logistics do you have to support the individuals? Um, there are, there are certain communities that are taking a fire station and doing quarantine in the fire station. There are um, certain communities that have gone out and established a contract with a local hotel. I will tell you that many of the hotel chains are seeing significant diminishment of travel. And so it's probably one of those things that you could do that but you're gonna to have to have that conversation as a public entity putting somebody that is potentially infectious into a private business. You're gonna to have to have your liability sorted out. So make sure you involve your attorney if you're gonna contract with a hotel in order to be able to um, quarantine or isolate people into a hotel. It will work well but everybody needs to be on the same page with that. It is unlikely that you will uh, need to quarantine the crews um, if the patient wears a mask and proper PPE is used. The issue is, is that we're just seeing, we're at the base of the curve that is going up, and um, because we are already at community spread, we don't know who has already been exposed, and they could have been exposed through work. They could have been exposed um, in, away from work. So we don't know, and as people get sick, they test um, your health officers are going to be looking at quarantining. The quarantine versus isolation, um, one of the guidances that was put out in the mitigation plan for 
um, the Seattle King County that was done by CDC is there's a caveat in there for healthcare providers that have been exposed that have not um, become symptomatic that they can continue to work, but they would need to wear a mask. Now they are treating the public safety uh, community differently and we are working with the IFF and the IFC are working together to work with um, CDC, uh, public health to find out um, if there's a way that we can begin to temporize uh, some of the quarantine. The issue is that our response force is um, fragile in most communities. We don't have a lot of medical surge. So quarantine is going to be one of those things that we're really going to have to look at and uh, see if, if, we can, if we can go ahead and have people work and uh, take countermeasures while they're at work, uh, if they've been exposed, they're asymptomatic. So those are some of the things that as this thing evolves, uh, we will continue to work that. Next slide. Um, so some other considerations that uh, before this is upon you, that you're gonna wanna talk with your elected leadership, um, whether that's a, your special district, uh, whether or not you're a city or a county agency, you're gonna wanna review your continuity of operations plan, or this is a good time to build one if you don't have that. How are you going to, do you have a plan for teleworking? Uh, for your office staff. If you don't, I would suggest that you brush that off. As this develops, um, one of the things that you're going to see at a state and county government level is recommendations for non-essential personnel to telework if they can or stay at home. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you've got a continuity of operations plan that addresses that. The next issue is a continuity of government plan because um, decisions have to be made. Um, many, many places have uh, Open Public Meetings Act or, or Open Public Records Acts in your state. You're gonna wanna take a look at that um, to see how would you do a virtual meeting? Can you do a virtual meeting? And again, this is one of those things that you're gonna wanna chat with competent counsel about. But as this, as this continues to go forward, um, and as they tighten up um, and the governors tighten up, it may very well be that uh, they're going to uh, make a very active suggestion to not do meetings. So then how do you do virtual, virtual meetings of your elected bodies? The next thing is, and Amit will get into the supply chain. I can tell you that in my conference calls with the state of Washington, our burn rate exceeds the supply chain that we're getting from the strategic national stockpile. And so at some point, we're going to run out of PPE. So I would highly suggest one of the things that the chiefs that are listening do is you take a look at what your PPE stocks are and you um, get um, an assessment of what your potential burn rate is and you can affect your burn rate by modifying your uh, tactical operations for EMS calls. In the state of Washington, what we have done for most agencies is that we have one person approach the patient. We typically have two people that are suited up. Um, others can get suited up if need be, but we're not uh, flooding the zone as it were with eight to 10 people for an EMS call. And we're trying to limit the number of people that are going up to the patient. Everybody else is on scene. They have supplies ready. But if they don't need to go in, they're not going in. Depending on how long this lasts, our supply chain issues will get worse. And our supply chain, um, you may have to get innovative. 
So um, on the IFC website, uh, if it isn't up there, we will have it up there this afternoon. The guidance from the FDA and CDC for industrial grade N95. Um, if you're a painter, if you work in a dusty place, there are industrial N95s that uh, they have given guidance that uh, those would be able to be used. Um, so at last count, uh, we were still able to go to some of our paint supply places, some of our farm supply places, and, in, and able to get industrial N95s. So that may be an innovative supply. One of the recommendations from a chief out of Colorado was uh, if his folks begin to run out of uh, gowns, that what uh, he's gone out and done is buy rain gear um, for everybody. And what they will do is uh, do the rain gear and then decon afterwards. Rain gear doesn't look like a hazmat suit. I'm not suggesting that that's the thing to do, but it may be one of those innovative supply issues that we get to if we run out of uh, gowns. So understand that the supply chain is going to be very important the longer this goes, and so you may have to get in innovative on your supply chain. The other thing that I'm encouraging all of the chiefs to do is um, take a look about your relationship management as it relates to your mutual aid plans for your local area, your region, your state, and your interstate. And we have um, uh, the enacted the EMS compact, um, and there are, I believe, 19 states that are signatories to that. So it is going forward, but just know and understand that um, this is going to do what's called hot spotting. There will be areas right now, uh, King County is one of the hottest areas in the, in the country, um, and it's, it's going to hot spot in areas and other areas won't have this, especially as we um, enact um, very rigid social distancing practices. So those are all things that I think that the chiefs need to be taking a look at. Um, understand that this is going to change. Please come back and take a look at um, the plan on a regular basis and understand that as things change, we're going to do additional webinars. So next slide. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Amit Kapoor, who's going to talk about some of the supply chain issues. Thank you. And I, I appreciate you giving the opportunity to talk about, I'm going to talk about four different areas, um, PPE, testing, treatment, disinfection. Um, it was covered pretty well in terms of the PPE side, where N95s, um, the supply chain for N95 is being picked up by the SNS, the Strategic National Stockpile. The CDC is uh, requesting all domestic manufacturers of N95 supply directly to the federal government to backfill uh, quite a bit of what they've been burning through. Um, the current request numbers that we have seen have minimum of 500 million to over um, 1 billion masks being requested for domestic production. Main reason is what we're seeing from China is they're being very protective of their own supply chain there and keeping masks that you know were usually um, manufactured there and shipped over. North Central and South America production is, is right now um, at capacity, a million uh, masks a week. They are upping that um, over time. CDC is already um, headed down to those countries and requests them to uh, bring those masks up to the United States as the uh, pandemic expands out. Same issues are occurring with gloves and gowns um, with limited supply. Uh, she said it exactly right. Check your burn rates and, and truly track out what you're using and change tactics on how uh, responders and how response is done. There's been a couple of things that have been done on the federal level with emergency use authorizations to expand the use of expired N95s. Um, 
NIOSH exp you know, expanding their um, requirements in healthcare settings. China accounts for half of the mass production in the world, and it, it basically nationalized all its factories and blocked all exports. And so a lot of countries are going to have to do it on their own. And what we're competing on is the European uh, pull of stock, uh, the Middle East. It, it, a lot of other countries are pulling U.S. stock and working with your local suppliers and making sure that they're aware that you need or will need in the long haul these N95s, gloves, and gowns for PPE. Talking about testing, and it was covered very well, um, Dr. Augustine really did a good job on this, where the major, major issue for testing, and it, this is a all across the board issue with reagents. So the reagents are made in Germany and Spain. Um, there are some new testing that's coming online soon, but it has to go through FDA clearance. CDC is looking at it. And we're talking about issues with just swabs. Um, transporting swabs back into the United States, um, this, has been a, this has been an issue and it's been on short supply. Um, I, today, I just got some updates on thermometers, for example, and you're, what we're seeing is a lot of schools, a lot of other government agencies, so outside of fire EMS, um, other, P, other uh, remediation companies who are picking up and overstocking on these supplies. So that's who we're competing with um, in the supply chain. In the treatment side, um, the ventil for ventilators, what we're finding and what we're hearing is, uh, and I just got, this update just came across where during the governor's meeting, it, states need to start preparing their own respirators and ventilators and, and not waiting for the federal government to pull from the strategic national stockpile. This is a major challenge. Uh, how many ventilators do we have in stock and how many are, how many are available with um, these vendors that you usually work with? From the estimated quantity that we've seen in numbers, we're seeing between 75,000 to 100,000 operational ventilators in the United States. Um, don't know if that's going to be enough and how, how long this pandemic is going to last. So securing what might be available through your medical um, chain of supply and find out what, what they're working on. The UK government is instituting with their industry um, additional manufacturing sites to, to start building up ventilators and truly letting uh, suppliers know uh, that, hey, we need ventilators and we're, we might need them in the future. On the disinfection side, and this has been ever growing and ever changing, um, we, EPA is on this on a daily basis. Um, some of the information that we're pulling is, is been, being updated in a, within the last couple hours. EPA has expanded the list of approved disinfectants. It started at close by 85, it's now at 200. And the reason, main reason is, Supplies are, sh are short, and they're still short. Um, suppliers of these disinfectants are having similar issues with uh, they can't telework. You can't get your manufacturing facility to telework to manufacture goods and equipment. So they're having to deal with uh, folks who might have coronavirus, who have self-quarantine or self-isolation. So getting that supply chain up and operational to manufacture these, these supplies. The coronavirus is very easy to disinfect. So that is that is a good portion of this. You don't need a uh, a very difficult disinfectant. Uh, easy, and that list covers a, a pretty good um, supply what's out there. The next thing, how are you going to apply these disinfectants? And that's just something that it needs to be looked at. There is a one to three month back order right now on foggers and electrostatic sprayers. And many, many are made in China. So again, China is blocking those exports out. The U.S. manufacturers, um, you know, they, they got wind, uh, China got wind that their supply was dwindling, and they started to contract with the U.S. manufacturers to pick up tens of thousands of sprayers and foggers from the U.S. market. We are working with those suppliers to reallocate for U.S. Um, EMS and fire, as well as schools and remediation companies. The real, real key is the challenge is still out there. The challenge has just started. And... Uh, it, to get prepared, to get back in preparedness level, it's truly communicating, communicating internally with your procurement officers or your safety officers to discuss with them that they should be checking with their supply chain, your suppliers, and asking them what do they have in stock. And this changes on a daily basis. So getting the understanding of how do you guys can how can you guys get the regular updates from your suppliers and making sure that state contracts are all buckled, you know, buttoned down. And, and you guys those kind of this? Like, no? no. Okay. All right. Um, 
that's all I have on my side. Um, back to you guys. Hi, Chief. Great. And uh, next we have uh, Mr. Ken LaSalle, the IFC's uh, Director of Government Relations. Hi, this is Ken LaSalle, the IFC's Director of Government Relations. Um, and I'm just here to give you an update, kind of what's going on at the federal and congressional levels. Um, at the, um, you know, obviously, as you all heard on Friday, the president issued an emergency declaration. And just to clarify what that means, uh, you know, FEMA's put out some guidance, but basically they want to make it clear uh, that HHS remains the lead federal agency in responding to the COVID-19 uh, and the uh, coronavirus. Um, FEMA's actions will be in support of HHS. And um, this is kind of important. Um, what you should be doing at this point is starting to get in touch with your state emergency managers to find out specifically how each state's gonna move forward. Uh, FEMA's guidance did make it clear that eligible protective, eligible emergency protective measures taken at the direction or guidance of public health officials in response to this emergency and not supported by authorities of other federal agencies uh, shall be reimbursed strictly under the FEMA Public Assistance Program. The FEMA assistance will be provided at a 75% federal cost share. Uh, the type of reimbursable activities that you're talking about include emergency protective measures such as the activation of state emergency operation centers, National Guard costs, law enforcement, and other measures necessary to protect public health and safety. So, um, as you can see, it's kind of big, and I think probably each state will be kind of tackling this differently. Uh, we have been in touch with NEMA, which is the State Emergency Managers Association, and asked them for more guidance. If we get something specific, we'll pass it along or post it on our uh, coronavirus. And the governor is going to talk right after the president's done. Um, but yeah, so basically, um, uh, ignoring that, uh, you know, what we're doing is waiting to see, um, uh, you know, basically what we urge is you talk to your state emergency manager and move forward. Um, moving on to what Congress is doing, uh, a couple of things. Uh, as you all know, Congress has already passed an emergency supplemental. Um, that bill is now uh, law, and it's got a couple of different pieces to it which are important. Uh, first of all, the uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has received a billion dollars for a state and local preparedness grant program, uh, of which, oh, actually it's $2.2 .2 billion, of which $1 billion is supposed to be released to the states, cities, and tribes within 30 days. Uh, also, CDC has received $300 million for its Infectious Diseases Rapid Response Fund. Uh, and then also, ASPR, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response, has received $3.1 billion, uh, and that's for its Public Health so and Social Services Emergency Fund. Uh, that's supposed to be used for procurement of medical supplies to supplement the strategic national stockpile. Um, so with that, there's uh, some more information out there. And then finally, as the slide makes reference to uh, the uh, National Institute of, on Environmental Health Sciences is receiving $10 million for worker-based training to prevent and reduce exposure for hospital employees, first responders, and other workers. So there's a bunch of different uh, funds out there. Uh, Chief Ludwig actually met with the uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of ASPR on Tuesday. One of the big things we highlighted was the need for funding not just go to the states, but also go to local governments. Um, however, this is one of those things, again, you probably need to start talking to your state health officials and start contacting them about how to get access to some of this information and, and some of this funding. Um, the House also has moved forward. Uh, they just on Friday slash Saturday night passed a new um, coronavirus related bill. Uh, in there, there's a lot of things which are more related to um, improving the economy, and I think you'll probably see some more bills passing in the future to address that. Um, probably one of the big things is, um, you know, regarding uh, some of the testing, and the big thing it comes down to is that the House passed bill would allow um, it both, it will basically would pay insurers and also allow Medicare, Medicaid, uh, the Veterans Health Administration, the Indian Health Services would all be allowed to start testing people uh, for free. Now, again, that bill has not passed the, the Senate at this point. There may be some changes back and forth, 
Um, but that's the other current uh, coronavirus related bill that's moving and should at some point be addressed by the end of the week. So that's kind of where we are from the federal perspective. Uh, we're going to move on. Um, just so you know, uh, like I said, uh, Chief Ludwig was here in D.C. on Tuesday. Uh, he met, like I said, with Asper, but also we met with some of the White House staff with the National Security Council. And the big thing we've been focused on is uh, a couple of things. First of all, prioritizing the need for resources to get to the locals, especially personal protective equipment and also drugs. Uh, probably the big thing we've also tried to do is find out and ask the administration to start letting uh, the fire and emergency service know when there's drug shortages. Uh, so that's one of the things so that way uh, fire chiefs in the field can start working with their medical directors to start to deal with some issues if we start having uh, drug shortages. Big thing also we're starting to look at some issues regarding surge capacity. Uh, Chief Sinclair did talk about quarantine. One of the things we've asked for is better guidance for the CDC for emergency responders when they should or should not be quarantined. But then related to that, the fact that when you do have these shortages, um, you know, the IFC has been pushing for the need to be able to uh, move resources across states um, and then also have some discussion about telehealth issues. Uh, and then the other thing we've discussed too, obviously, is when folks are, are quarantined, there's some issues regarding backfilling positions and then what you do concerning uh, funding folks who actually are quarantined. So these are some of the big issues which we're working on um, and uh, we'll be communicating that both uh, to the executive branch and also with the folks on Capitol Hill. <clears throat> now we're gonna turn it over to uh, Jeff Doolin to talk about some of the other tools we're working on. Uh, good afternoon. So currently what we have is we stood up a survey to be able to allow fire departments to provide information into a national view of the impact that the COVID-19 is having on our personnel resources. Understanding that when you have an exposure and those firefighters have to go into isolation or quarantine, uh, that is resource depletion in our departments. So we're looking at this on a national level and seeing how this is being affected or it's affecting us, but then also looking at what is the trend? Are we getting better? Or are we getting worse? So the survey is there on the link on our webpage on the coronavirus webpage. You can click on the link, fill the survey out once a day. We ask the departments to update it every day because your numbers may change. If you don't have any exposures uh, or anybody in quarantine, then you don't need to do it. But if you do have those, we ask that you do that to help us keep a good pulse on the nation of what's happening. In addition to that, uh, several of our states that are part of the NMAS project, the National Mutual Aid System, are actually utilizing the system right now. Uh, we had a call this morning. We're actually going in and adding some new and additional resources that are being stood up in response to this event uh, that are specifically for either epidemiology or uh, medical teams out in the field or things like that, that we're able to go in and put those in the system, track them, find out what's available, uh, and then where those resources are deployed to. Again, if you have any questions about the survey or the dashboard, please reach out to us through the email uh, for the ISC, the coronavirus email, and then we'll get right back to you on there. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna now turn it back over to Chief Ludwig for a closing thoughts and finish this out. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I just wanna say uh, thank you to our interim CEO, Rob Brown, and the IFC staff for putting this webinar together. I also want to thank the panelists for all the outstanding information that they provided today. Also, thanks to Chief John Sinclair for chairing our coronavirus task force and the yeoman job that he's doing. Uh, he, 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 he took this task on without any hesitation or reservation. And again, I'm so proud of the job he's doing. The IFC continues to stay on top of this fluid and ever changing issue that almost is changing by the hour. Uh, we are engaged daily as Ken LaSalle said in conference calls with the White House, Health and Human Services, and other federal partners. I had the opportunity to meet with some of those individuals while I was there last week, and I know our staff continues again on a daily basis to uh, be engaged in White House conference calls and, and other conference calls with our federal partners. Lastly, as we all know, there is some panic out there in some of our communities, and I just wanna emphasize again that it, this is not a time for us as leaders to further enhance that panic in our communities. We will get through this. We are a resilient people. Lastly, please visit ifc.org backslash COVID-19 to get up-to-date information and complete the survey if you have any firefighter exposures in your departments as Jeff just talked about. 
Finally, I am honored to be president and chairman of the board of the International Association of Fire Chiefs during such a critical time with so many outstanding professionals who are leading in their communities during this precarious period. I have no doubt we will get through this because of the caliber of those who work in fire and EMS. Thank you for joining us today.